can you believe it's the last day in October? Dear me, you are most welcome to this video, of course, as always. Now, in the last video, we did a bit of an update on the US. I want to sort of focus more on the United Kingdom at the moment. And the UK is kind of in context with a lot of Europe, really, and the great increase in cases we're seeing throughout Europe. And we know that quite uh, significant lockdown measures and stronger powers have been taken by quite a few European countries. So let's look at the UK now in a little more detail. That was what we were talking about, the guarding in Poland. Now, the BBC claimed there's a leaked scientific advisory group for emergencies document. Now, I don't know whether this is leaked or whether it was officially published today. But the data is already more, more than two weeks old, so I'm not quite sure what's going on here. But the BBC said it was leaked anyway. And it's about the worst case scenario for this winter, which is um, 85,000 deaths. So the sort of scientific advisory group for emergencies have been working on this scenario of the worst case scenario of 85,000 people dying this winter, in addition to the... 45 to 50,000 that have already died from this pandemic. Another 85,000 deaths potentially this winter. I believe the vaccines are coming in spring. This is going to go away. I'm convinced of that. But we've got this winter to get through yet. And at the end of the last video, I'm just going to say this briefly, but a um, lot of shops and things are doing very well on the masks, very well on the hygiene. There's still rubbish at the ventilation. Why aren't we ventilating places better? We really need to improve ventilation in the UK. It's, it's not places aren't well ventilated. We're doing everything right in terms of social distancing. Mass wearing when I was shopping today was 100%. Sanitisation was excellent. Ventilation was terrible. Why don't, why don't we get this bit? It's um, very frustrating. Anyway... Um, 85,000 deaths potentially over the winter. Quite frightening numbers, really. Now, um, mid-October, the, 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 uh, the, the, this report, um, I'm going to give you the full report in a minute, is saying that there were between 43 and 74,000 new infections per day, according to their data. And this is the paper it's from. Uh, it's called a consensus statement from the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Modelling Operational Subgroup. Blah, 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 blah. There you go. Anyway, it's part of SAGE. And re read it for yourself. There's the reference. Uh, and they're saying that the uh, R value is between 1.3 and 1.5. So somewhat consistent with the pessimistic Imperial College R value somewhat inconsistent with the King's College value based on the COVID symptom tracker app. More of which uh, in, in a minute. You know, one of the things, and, and this applies to the UK and, and to the US data that we've, uh, we've looked at in the last video, um, the, the, the quality of news reporting is really quite poor. And... In virtually all of the news reports that you read, they don't give you the links through to the original article. We're supposed to take their word for it. You know, we really do need more links so we can check data for ourselves. Like, like I mean, that's what I do. You know, um, there's no reason why we shouldn't have these links in all the newspaper reports, and because you know, if we're, if we're reading online these days, you just click them. Well, why is there such a reluctance to do that? I really don't know why that is. Uh, and it makes it hard to verify what's being said by a lot of mainstream media. I mean, a lot of it's very accurate. But of course, we've got the constant problem on the BBC and ITV, for example, where uh, the people doing the reporting aren't nurses, doctors, virologists. You know, they're, they're often financial journalists and things like that. You know, th there's real problems with the mainstream media reporting in the UK and and. Uh, at least some of the US channels I've watched, their, their medical correspondents are doctors or, uh, you know, they've got backgrounds in medicine and healthcare. Whereas UK journalists just don't. It's, 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 it's hard to explain, really. In fact, I find it quite bizarre, but yeah, there you go. 
How can they be expected to know the background? They simply can't. Right, th th this, this committee, this SAGE is saying in England, we are breaching the number of infections and hospital admissions in the reasonable worst case scenario. Now this was published on the 14th of um, 14, well, no, it was written. It was written on the 14th. It's only just been leaked, stroke, published. So it's already, what, 14, 15, 16, 17 days out of date. So let, let, well, let's see if it's come true. So here, here's some of the current government data. So um, daily new cases officially diagnosed 24,000, getting on for a million uh, cases altogether. But of course, a lot of those were back in the, in the so-called first wave. And here we see the figure. That's cases by specimen date, uh, cases by date reported. So from the 14th, when this was done, the cases on the 14th were just under 20,000 per day. Now we see that there, uh, that was on the 27th, 22,000 per day. So we haven't seen a rise as large as they were predicting by the looks of this in terms of new cases. But what about... Um, healthcare capacity. So um, here we have uh, patients in hospital. So that, that, that's patients going into hospital. These are patients actually in hospital. And to be frank, this is quite concerning. We are not seeing this feed through into deaths. The, the increase in cases is not as severe as this report anticipated, but the hospitalizations are increasing really quite dramatically. So this was the peak. So that was back in April. So we're looking at what just under 20,000 patients actually in hospital. So this is this is patients in hospital. And uh, now um, we're getting up to. Well, we're about halfway, halfway we were at the peak, aren't we? So this rate of increase um, is not is not sustainable. This, this is my main concern at the moment, which is the increase in hospitalizations. Um, almost certain to exceed this within the next two weeks. Well, that hasn't quite happened, but the direction of hospitalizations is is poor. And the fact that the cases haven't increased as much as they thought just shows that even although this is like the best sort of specialist committee in the country, they're still not getting it exactly right. Um, yeah, they're not. Now, now we're talking about uh, tier four uh, restrictions now in the in England. Now, of course, in Scotland, they have five tiers. In England, we only have three tiers. So they're clearly thinking about an, an additional measures to reduce the spread, therefore reduce the hospitalizations, and a sort of circuit breaker national lockdown for England is being mooted in some circles, similar to the situation in Wales. And there's talk about closing the Welsh border, basically closing the Welsh border, which, to be fair, does does make quite a bit of sense. We've seen that work in Australia. Um, now, Office for National Statistics, I always like to go to them. The quality of data is pretty definitive, really, because it's already happened. They're looking at things that have already happened, so they know they're not speculating about the future. Um, so office, and so th this, is the, um, this was released on the 30th of October, so it's bang up to date. Uh, that's the website there. Check it out for yourself. Infection survey here, number of infections from the 17th to the 23rd of October, where they have complete data, look it up for yourself. And they say quite clearly, UK number of infections continues to rise. So England, the prevalence they're saying here is um, 568,000 people actually with the disease in England. Prevalence is the number of people who have the disease at the present time. Incidence is the number of new cases. So prevalence is how many people have got it now. So uh, in that week, 17th to 23rd of October, we see pretty high numbers in England. 1% basically. Um, 
9.52 new COVID-19 infections for every um, 10,000 people. So it's, it's, so it's actually naught, it's actually naught 0.95 percent isn't it that would work out at actually with the disease at the time um, now this has increased in all age groups over the past two weeks and of course we are concerned that this is now spreading to older age groups teenagers and young adults are still the highest current rates uh, for, for this week current for the week of the 17th to 23rd of October um, but older people increasingly becoming infected as well. Rates appear to be steeply increasing in secondary school age and of course this was completely inevitable. I, I think that the, the officially people talk about um, infections in the home as being the most infection driving scenario where one family is visiting another but of course very often the young people and the children in that family have been to school and we, we know that kids don't follow all the social distancing all the time it's just not in their nature to do that so I, I, I think a lot of what we're seeing now a lot of the resurgence we're seeing now is education driven the country has decided to prioritize education um, my views on that are somewhat different. I think education can be acquired any time, but that's what the government decided to prioritise. Um, Northwest uh, Yorkshire and Humber area still quite highly uh, higher incidence, high prevalence. Northeast numbers are high in the northeast, sort of Newcastle area, Newcastle upon Tyne area, but now levelled off. They don't seem to be increasing, so that's good news. Um, but in England as a whole, that represented, the figures in England as a whole represented, uh, um, according to the RNS data, 51,900 new cases per day. So pretty well consistent with the SAGE data we've just looked at. Now, Wales, prevalence 26,120 people. Northern Ireland, 24,150 people. And Scotland, prevalence 37,400 um, positivity rate 0.71 which is reasonably low but affecting one in a um, one in 140 people okay so so that is the countries in the UK now this is where it gets interesting because just to remind ourselves yesterday we looked at this this was the Imperial College figures 16th to the 25th of October. Um, so similar kind of time that they're talking about. Uh, they did uh, 96,000 tests. That, uh, sorry, they said, they, did, they said there was 96,000 cases per day in England. So we see that the real figure in that period. What was the exact period? The exact period was 17th to the 23rd. So pretty close, pretty close. So we see that that figure is an overestimate. And the real figure is uh, 51, uh, 50, say 52,000. So we can say that's wrong. The real figure is about 52,000. When we compare it to the uh, Office for National Statistics. Um, the COVID symptom tracker app number at 43,000 was much more accurate. But of course, this is the COVID symptom tracker app. So this is giving the number of symptomatic people we have to add 20 to 30% to get the real number. So you can see if we add, well, you can probably do it in your head. Um, I'm not sure I can, but I add 20% to, to 43,000 and then you get another 10 or 15,000 cases. Um, so another 10,000 cases, isn't it? So, so you can see that the COVID symptom tracker app, um, I can't work it out in my head, sorry. But you can see that the COVID symptom tracker app is roughly consistent with the office for for national statistics. I should have worked that out before I came on the video. So that's the Office for National Statistics figure. That was the over high Imperial College figure. Uh, I should say I have no interest in either of these institutions. Well, no, no uh, financial or uh, work-based uh, associations. 
but we see that the uh, the Zoe symptom tracker app data is much closer. Uh, this says the R is 1.56, that says the R is 1.1. Uh, Imperial said the doubling time was nine days, but given the number of cases is less, it's, it's going to be longer than that. And the Zoe symptom tracker app says 28 days. So the other thing I thought was uh, interesting that we can do is here is the uh, here's the graph from the COVID symptom tracker app. Now this is talking about um, sort of about about this. So th 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 this is th these dates here. That's the um, let's get rid of me a minute. Uh, so that's the thirtieth. That's the sixteenth. So we're talking about sort of mid October here, about the twentieth of October. So if we kind of draw a line up there. Um, we get we, we get to uh, numbers on this graph for that time period that are so I've just drawn a line up there maybe zoom out a bit we'll see it better you might have the technology there we go yep so this is the kind of time frame we're talking about and and that's relating to what about about four hundred thousand about four hundred thousand uh, cases. But of course, we have to add 20 to 30 percent for the asymptomatic cases. So that does take us up to a number which is is fairly consistent with the uh, Office for National Statistics number, which is that one. So that, that's the total UK prevalence for England, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales according to the Office for National Statistics in retrospective data. Of course, the COVID symptom track wraps way up here now. We're, we're at the end of October now. Um, but when we look back, we find that two weeks ago, when we have complete data, that the COVID symptom track wrap was giving fairly reasonable numbers. And I haven't got the numbers with me, but I did work out the, uh, the week before. And again, it did seem to be it did seem to be fairly consistent, so like like at the beginning of October, it will be there, around about two hundred and fifty thousand cases for a prevalence. So, I think we, what we can say to conclude yesterday's debate was while the methodology at Imperial was good methodology, and you can get all the references from yesterday's video, it did end up as an overestimate. It was an overestimate compared to the uh, COVID symptom tracker app. And I think more importantly, it was an overestimate compared to the uh, Office for National Statistics. And I think the Office for National Statistics is the nearest thing that we've got. And I have looked at this COVID symptom tracker app, well over a million people reporting every day. So it's a good sized study. And when you add 20, percent 25 percent for the asymptomatic cases some studies are showing asymptomatic cases are 30 percent in younger people of course we would expect it to be nearer 30 percent in older people it would be lower but but um when you add those numbers you actually get you actually get um figures which are, are pretty consistent with the office for national statistics figures at the same period of, of time so that's the point i was kind of trying to get over on that um, now, deaths, where are we? Yep. So deaths from the, for this time period. Now the deaths are always a bit delayed because of the days the delays with uh, death certificates and things like that. So it's always a bit further behind. Uh, but again, Office for National Statistics data, so it's good data. Week 42 ending on the 16th of October. Now the deaths, and this, is, this is actually really quite interesting. Deaths registered were 10,534, up 580 from week 41, the week before. So deaths were up. And uh, overall, all deaths are 6.8%. That is 669 deaths higher than the five year average for this time in October. So deaths are higher than the five-year average for October, but 
it's, it's recognised in the statistics of these things that the numbers would have to get to 1,200 deaths above the norm to be classified as excess above um, random expected variations. So what this is saying is the deaths in the 9th to the 16th of October in England and Wales were actually not above average, not statistically above average. A little bit above average, but that happened some years. So this is partly due to the low incidence of influenza, which helps, but it still remains the case that um, the deaths up until the 16th of October were not above the five year average. Now, if we actually go on to this government data again, we can get the deaths so we can see what the latest is on death. So if we go to the UK, and of course, this is deaths within 28 days of a positive test. That's these figures here, uh, 274 today. There's no question that number's increasing up to 46,000 now. And these are the numbers where COVID is on the death certificate up to uh, up to 58,000 where COVID is, is on the death certificate. Uh, so there we have um, deaths within 28 days of a test for the country as a whole. It's by date of test reported. So what should we use? Uh, deaths within 28 days of a positive test by date of death. So, well, the deaths are rising, but not as significantly as cases and not as significantly as hospitalizations, much like we've been seeing in the United States. So quite hopeful here that the, the uh, case fatality rate is, is going down. And remember, we're hopeful of an infection fatality rate of 0.3 or hopefully even less. Hopefully get some updates on that figure soon. But carrying on with the deaths in the UK. Um, yep. Yeah, so, oh, so basically, we can't say they're significantly above average now. Now, of course, I do unfortunately suspect that by the time we get the next set of data for the week after that, the death, well, the deaths are going to increase. We know that. And within the next few weeks, they probably will be above the, the normal variation. But up until the 16th of October, the, the death rate has been lower than we might have hoped. Somewhat inconsistent with the, the, the pessimistic scenarios uh, painted by the scientific group, uh, the, the SAGE scientific group for emergencies. Um, but of course, we've got a long way to go in this winter yet. And it still could be that their 85,000 worst case scenario is, well, let's hope we get nowhere near that, but um, it's not impossible. Um, 670 certificates mentioned uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 rep representing 6.4% of all deaths. So again, similar to what, uh, it was slightly higher than that in the United States, but not a lot. So about 6.4% of, of all deaths at the moment. And the good thing about the UK data is we separate coronavirus from influenza and pneumonia, which is um, makes it somewhat more, more clear. So that's an increase of uh, 300, 232 deaths compared to week uh, 41. So an increase of 232 deaths uh, compared to week 41. That, that's coronavirus deaths, of course. 4.4% uh, of all deaths that week. So the most recent week here, it was 6.4% of all deaths. Uh, the week before that, so that would be the week ending the 9th, it was 4.4% of all deaths. So again, we are seeing a rise, we are seeing a rise, but still not above what would be uh, potentially expected through variation in a normal year. I think it's important, to, you know, this is why it's important to go back to the Office for National Statistics and just see what the real, the actual data is saying, because the media often do sort of report this badly the office for national statistics is the definitive 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 data the number of deaths in hospitals remains below the five-year average now 
We've seen that deaths are slightly up, but not massively. But let's just assume deaths are slightly up in the country as a whole, this 6% or so. But the number of deaths in hospitals remains below the five-year average. Therefore, obviously, this means more people are dying at home and more people are dying in care facilities. And it's mostly people dying at home. So why, as we're in this pandemic, should the number of deaths remain below the five-year average in hospital, but be above the five-year average at home? And this is very concerning because I think when people are developing COVID pneumonia, they are so obviously ill. They'll be breathing quickly. They'll be finding it difficult to breathe. Um, that, that they'll be obviously ill. And the respiratory distress would seek someone to, to get medical advice. So I don't think it's that people are dying of COVID-19 at home. So why is it that deaths at home are above average, deaths in hospital are below average? I fear it's because there's many other conditions which would normally be hospitalised, which are not being hospitalised. So I fear we've got this sort of collateral damage in deaths at the moment. And this is why it's so important that if you're worried about something, whether it's a symptom of cancer, whether it's a chest pain, whatever it is, if you would normally go and see a doctor or normally take medical advice, then carry on doing that. Because I fear, I can't prove this, I can't prove this at the moment, but I fear that people are dying at home of other conditions that would be potentially treatable in hospital. That could explain the lower hospital deaths, the higher deaths at home. But the actual deaths involving COVID-19 in hospitals are 8.4 all hospitalised deaths. And we've seen the, uh, the screen there for the patients currently hospitalised, which in fact, I think that is the most worrying graph I've shown you today there. Um, that increase in hospitalisations is really quite stark. Yeah, that's 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 quite dramatic. Half where we were at the peak. <clears throat> now, um, patients uh, in mechanically ventilated beds, not necessarily mechanically ventilated, but in in the critical care situation. And again, we see the numbers now are up to eight hundred and fifty two, whereas it was well over three thousand. So, proportionately less strain on. Uh, critical care capacity compared to general hospital capacity. So that's where we are at the UK. Um, but there's no question that cases are increasing and we are getting more areas of the country going into phase uh, tier two and tier three lockdown situations with the possibility of, uh, of more coming and um, I said this at the end of the last video, but this is causing a lot of social problems. So anyone who is isolated, anyone who is suffering because of this, communicate with them, come alongside them, talk to them through the window if that's all you can do. And, and if you yourself are distressed, and this is the, the hardest thing to do, I think especially in English culture, this is the hardest thing to do. If you yourself are distressed, let people know because Strangely enough, there's an awful lot of people out there want to help you. Okay, thank you for watching this video as always.